Bon dia a tothom. Anem a començar la primera xerrada, que és de la professora Wendy Carling. Good morning, and thank you very much for coming here today. It's a pleasure for us. And just thank you again for, uh, for being so easy to, to contact you, okay? So <laughs> it has been very, very, very easy. So uh, it's, a, it's a really uh, a pleasure for, for, for participating in this, uh, in this workshop today. Uh, la professora, uh, com a totes les jornades que fem en, en aquest àmbit, sempre portem, intentem portar un keynote speaker, diguéssim, que, bueno, diguéssim no, digués, és, que el que intenta fer o que li demanem que faci és que ens doni una mica de perspectiva de què s'està fent en el seu àmbit a Europa. Uh, van conèixer la professora Wendy Carling uh, arrel del, del que en diuen el Core Project, que és una, una plataforma d'aprenentatge en línia que ens que explica o intenten, i ens ho explicarà ella, intenten esbrinar maneres d'ensenyar economia d'arreu del món, noves metodologies docents. I pensàvem, justament això és el que volem. La professora és de la UCL, de la Universitat College of London, investigadora del CEP, Center for Economic Policy and Research, i la seva recepta ho resumeixo, eh? Les seves recerques centren la macroeconomia i les institucions de rendiment econòmic i l'economia de la transició. És membre del panell consultiu després de l'Oficina de Responsabilitat Pressupostària del Regne Unit, a part de liderar el projecte CORE, que és el que us deia, pel qual la convidàvem, i el 2015 va rebre el premi comanador de l'Orde de l'Imperi Britànic per serveis de l'àmbit d'economia i de les finances públiques. So, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. I find it easier to stand up. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I have linguistic problems, so I can only guess what the, the, the rest of the discussion ha has been about, but I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to engage and to share what's happening around the world uh, in terms of the reform of economics education. Uh, with you and with the, uh, the Catalonian university system. It's a, it's a really impressive organization that you have to bring together uh, all of the different universities to kind of think collectively about problems of uh, pedagogy and what, what we should be doing um, in the classroom and, and to, to stimulate our students. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm gonna focus on economics education including the economics content of business degrees. So there's some kind of limits to the, the sort of expertise that I've got. What I'm going to do is to, first of all, ask what, what are the challenges we face in the 21st century? Um, where are they coming from? And I think there are at least three different sources of pressure on us. One is from the public, including the media. The other is from employers. And the third is from students. And we have to ask ourselves whether these pressures on us are kind of pushing us in the same direction or whether, whether there are conflicts. And this is something that you may want to uh, reflect more on. I'm going to talk about an international project that has emerged in response to the pressure from these three groups, from the public <coughs> employers and uh, our students. And um, it, it, uh, it, 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 this response hangs around three dimensions. I'm going to talk about new content and to try to convince you that the problems that economists are uh, called on to face, that we should be facing, are, have changed. That economics as we do it, as researchers, has really changed. And that economics education has lagged behind and that we need to, and we can, bring it into line so that it's, it's fit for purpose, both uh, as a response to the, to the problems and as a response to, uh, uh, to the pressures that are coming from, from these different constituencies. And that we should feel good about it because it brings economics education much closer to how we do economics. So we, we, we're, we can do in the classroom something that we feel more, uh, more content with. Uh, I'm going to talk about new pedagogy and I'll explain that as I, as I go along and also talk about new skills where again pressure is coming on us, from our students uh, in particular, but also from employers, <coughs> really centered around the, the central needs of students to be able to handle, and, uh, handle data and to be able to communicate with, uh, with, with, with others. 
Right, so start, starting off with the challenges. Let's um, begin with the public. And here, the big pressure on economics as a discipline uh, uh, crystallized around the time of the global financial crisis. So economists were really in the doghouse, and I assume you have the same expression in Catalan. So we were really under pressure, and it, it kind of came to a head with, with the Queen uh, saying, uh, why, no one, why did no one see the, the credit crunch coming? And she, of course, refers to the effect on, on her personal fortune. But I think her, 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 her view about this was, was, was a much wider one. And she was really pointing the finger at us and saying, why did no one see the financial crisis coming? But it's economists as well who've, uh, who've uh, uh, reflected this pressure. And uh, the no Nobel laureate, Ro uh, Robert Schiller, uh, wrote this this article, what's the point of economists? And he was really saying, why is, has the failure to foresee the financial crisis stoked so much anger against the profession? This has had its uh, reflection in, uh, the, in the UK as well in the debate about Brexit. So a whole uh, gang of Nobel Prize winning economists warned against the long-term damage that would accompany Brexit. But then the a former education minister, right? Education minister, in who was who'd shift to a different portfolio, but he had been an education minister. Michael Gove said in this famous uh, uh, debate on television that Britons have had enough of experts. And uh, and Martin Wolf, who in the, writes in the Financial Times, probably the best known uh, economics commentator around the world asks us the question, why economists failed as experts and how to make them matter again. So there's really a lot of pressure on us. What about employers? Where's the, the uh, what, what do they think about what we're doing um, and what we're doing in the classroom? The, there's a survey that's been done for several rounds uh, in the UK by the Economics Network. It's out in the field at the moment, so there'll be new results. These are a bit old but this, these are the latest ones. And uh, they, the, the, one of the questions, how do you rate the general skills of economics graduates? And we obviously want to focus on the problems, what they think are not so, not, not so great. And uh, critical self-awareness, so there is a sense that economists and uh, economic graduates perhaps are on the arrogant side. Uh, the ability to apply what has been learned to a wider context. This comes back to us a lot. This comes back from employers in the private sector, in consultancies, in the Bank of England, in the Treasury. Students arrive with all these models in their heads, all these techniques, but confronted with an actual problem that they have to think about, they're really flailing around. Uh, the ability to communicate clearly in writing is a problem, uh, at least with students in, in, in the UK. And they, there's a problem of a general lack of creative and imaginative powers. I assume this applies to the experience of employers with graduates from all different kinds of programs. This is, I'm sure, not just a program with uh, a problem with economics graduates. The, the discussion that's going to follow this one relates to the survey that's been uh, carried out here. And you see similar kinds of issues arising. So the ability to manage complexity and uncertainty to offer new ideas and solutions. So again, this focus on creativity, uh, autonomy, uh, independence, ap applying what you know in, in a different context. But then let's turn to the third pressure group, the students. Uh, what, what, what do these students actually think that economists should, should be doing? Uh, and we, what we've done is to uh, take an empirical approach to this and try and find out. And we've, we've projected this question in classrooms around the world. So what, what is the most pressing issue that economists today should address? The, the data comes from over 4,000 students from 25 universities in 12 countries. So just in your heads, right, think. This is day zero probably even b before the first day of the first semester of students at university. A classroom full, fuller than this, 
and they get projected the question and they have to either with an audience response system or on a piece of paper um, respond to this. Okay, so everyone's got something in your head what you think these students are going to come up with. So this is the result. Uh, it's, it's quite striking. We, we had no uh, idea what we would get and we certainly did not expect to get this. So this is, comes back repeatedly that students are very focused on inequality. Unemployment shows up in countries, interestingly, there's a country difference in countries where especially youth unemployment is high. But they're concerned about environmental su sustainability, they're concerned about the future of work, uh, 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 they're concerned about, if we just um, blow up the bit that, where the words are so small, so again, um, global warming crisis, they're concerned about digitalization, you can see there, robots, the, uh, so, and, and, and aspects of stability, sort of traditional ones, but also financial stability. So, okay, one question, are those pressures pushing in the same direction? And uh, I think they, they are. There are certain common, common themes that, that are coming through from, from, from those questions. And that's partly what lies behind this international project that's um, come together to try and meet the challenge. It's, what I'm going to show you is, is just an example. It's just an example of a project in economics, but I think it's got wider lessons for other disciplines. And the kind of model that we've used, a very bottom-up model, um, uh, could, could well be applied elsewhere. There are, because of digital technology, there are now the possibility for really deep international collaboration and really fast production of very high quality material online. And that's what, that's what we've done in this, this project. So we've pulled together a group of collaborators from top universities around the world and we focused on content, teaching and learning resources and on translations. So this gives you an idea what, what we've done. Uh, you can go online to the, uh, to the website. Everything is free and open access. There's an app, you can have it on your telephone. So if you, uh, on your mobile, if you're commuting, you can, you can read, what, read the material that's been produced. You can see there's a French translation up in the, the right-hand side. Uh, there's Jan Algon from Sciences Po uh, using the material. My colleague Antonio Cabrales, formerly uh, uh, from uh, Carlos III in, in Madrid, now head of department at UCL. Uh, there's a university in India. I could have covered the, the, uh, the, the slide with images from, uh, from universities around the world. Um, more than 200 are now using this material. So let me try and explain to you uh, what it is and how it's happened. We have one ebook called The Economy which is being used for specialist students. There's another one for a broader students, maybe a student in business, engineering, uh, public policy oriented degree programs. And then there's a Doing Economics, which uh, is a, uh, a project, set of projects using real data from the world about really existing problems and starting from scratch in terms of students' ability to handle data. And I'll, I'll uh, give you some some of the output later on. Okay, we've produced teachers and <laughs> students' resources. So this is the, uh, a glimpse of the people who've been involved. People from Universidad de los Andes, from the London School of Economics, from Oxford, from the University of Chile, Columbia University, uh, Boazici in uh, Turkey. We've got economists, economic historians, Kevin O'Rourke from Oxford, uh, environmental specialists, industrial economics specialists, public economists, and so on, and specialists in maths for economics. So this big group, plus hundreds of others who've contributed in other ways, have, uh, have uh, come together to change the content. And it's, as a kind of anchor, it's interesting to go back to the, to the first economics textbook, so the real, at least in the English language, the first modern textbook, which is Paul Samuelson's uh, Economics. So this was at MIT in 1948. 
The text written in the shadow of the Great Depression, he says, aims at an understanding of the economic institutions and problems of American civilization in the middle of the 20th century. That was his ambition. The problem at that time was unemployment. The response was a teachable version of Keynes, Keynes' economics. It brought to the classroom new big problem related research, so the active research that was taking place at the time. And he, he was ambitious. He had this hope, which he literally wrote down in his textbook. He hoped that by educating future policymakers and citizens, good policy would prevent another Great Depression. And you could say that the core project has responded to a new Samuelsonian moment. We're faced with really big problems on the scale of the Great Depression. And so we need to step up. We can't go teaching the, the, the same old stuff that was really born out of the golden age when economies seemed to be working very well or the great moderation. We now have serious problems and we have to move on. We have to use the best of contemporary research. We also have to tell our students about what economists really do. So this is Petra Moser from NYU. Uh, she's talking about innovation, one of the, the, the problems, the issues that was raised. Innovation is often not mentioned at all in economics degrees. It, it is, I'm sure, in business programs, but in economics, uh, often not. And she's here using data from 18th century Italian opera to show a connection between the property rights legislation at the time and the incentive to innovate. So this shows students what, account, what the kind of uh, logic, the resources, the, the data that economists now use to come to conclusions that are relevant for policy. This is uh, Anat Admati from Stanford talking about leverage and bank regulation uh, and uh, what, what's, what we need to do about it in the aftermath of the crisis. Okay, so uh, what do the modern texts do? This, uh, this chart here is the outcome of a machine learning um, project, so it's a research project which I haven't got time to explain. We just have to take it on trust. Um, and what we've done here is to take MANQ, which is the most commonly used economics textbook around the world, and to look at the uh, topics that are covered there and compare it with, with what we do in the, in the core text. If you look at the, uh, I can get this, yeah. It's gonna, yeah. If you look here, you can see that these are, it's an economics textbook. There's loads of stuff about elasticity and supply and demand in MANQ, which is on this side, and in CORE, which is on this side. So there are lots of things you'd expect to find in an economics textbook. But the, the black bars show you what is, is more emphasized in the standard course. This is about price taking markets, so supply and demand analysis. This appears very, very frequently. Uh, monetary policy, money supply and demand, and welfare effects of taxes. That's the, uh, the, the, the what's, what's mainly covered. And here we've got uh, different things that are brought in, particularly game theory and, and behavioral economics get a much bigger play. And that's how economists now do economics. It's much more relevant, of course, to students not only taking economics, but also taking uh, business and management courses. More emphasis on context, economic history. Students actually need to know something about somewhere when they're learning economics. Uh, it, it can't just be an abstract uh, mathemat applied <coughs> mathematics subject. Where should we begin a course in economics. They frequently begin with this choice between, um, between pizza and beer. We begin somewhere in the world, some really existing phenomenon, which is uh, the capitalist revolution, how capitalism revolutionized the way we live, and how economics attempts to understand that. So we begin with data uh, from the year 1000. Very, right at the start, we have the students imagining themselves uh, over that, those hundreds of years here where nothing happened. Nothing happened. And living standards were pretty similar across different uh, regions of the world. And then something happened. So it's pretty interesting. This is a phase transition from nothing 
to continuous growth. And the world that students inhabit is the one in which there are vast differences in living standards across different, different parts of the world. So you can see India and China um, finding their own hockey stick and uh, moving into this phase of continuous growth. Another uh, data set that we bring to students very early is this one. They can manipulate the data themselves just going online. Everything's online. Uh, you show this chart which lines up all the countries in the world from the lowest GDP per capita to the highest and then in each country from the poorest decile to the richest. Show this to an 11 year old and they say well this is clearly rubbish because everything's made in China. So you then show, okay, but this was the world in 1980. Then watch China. This is 1990. And watch the skyscrapers becoming more pronounced at the back. <coughs> this is a very dramatic demonstration of how the world has changed and how the world looks from the perspective of our students. This is why inequality is the first thing that comes to their minds. This is their experience um, in, in their country and in uh, the broader global context. So this is uh, not photoshopped. This is uh, the image that we, that we have on the front of the, of the e-book. Uh, it's a favela in Brazil, as you've probably guessed. But we're teaching economics. We're not just showing pictures. We're, we're, tr we're equipping students with analytical tools. So how can we teach inequality an analytically? Where we begin is with a pirate ship. And the reason we begin with a pirate ship is because uh, 18th century pirate ships were among the first organizations in the world to have written constitutions. So they literally wrote down who does what and who gets what on the pirate ship. So that's a way of cementing the idea of where the distribution comes from, can come from, uh, coming from the rules of the game in the minds of students. So here's the article, tells you exactly what the captain gets and what all the other members of the crew get of the booty when the pirate ship is uh, successful in um, uh, in its activities. Right, so the next, next thing is we, we want to give them an analytical framework, but we also want to get them to measure things. So this is teaching them the Lorenz curve and the Gini coefficient as measures of inequality. You've got along here the cumulative share of the ship's company from the lowest to the highest, and here the cumulative share of income. So if everything was shared equally, it the, we'd see things along this 45 degree line. So form in your head, think of a pirate ship and think what the Lorenz curve should look like for a pirate ship. Okay? Everyone got it in their head? There it is. That's using the data. So plot the data from the constitution and get a measure of inequality. Calculate the Gini coefficient. It's extremely low. Then find the ships that were chasing the pirate ships. Collect the data, plot the Lorenz curve and calculate the Gini coefficient. So think in your mind what that's gonna look like. Okay, there it is. Get your students thinking about why should inequality be lower on a pirate ship than on the ships that are chasing the pirate ship? What tools do we need if we're gonna understand these differences in inequality? Then you want to go, of course, to the data, a really existing country. So this is the Netherlands. And here we've got the, the pre-tax and the post-tax Lorenz curve and Gini coefficients. OK, this is just a tiny example. Let me um, move on to the, uh, to, to, to the pedagogy. I'm running out of time. So the standard way is to teach from theory to application in economics, from the abstract and then hopefully you find an application later on. Maybe not in the first year, maybe not in the second year, but if you stick at it, you'll probably get there in the third year. We start the other way around. Start with context and application, develop the theory, and then go back and test it. Example, why do working hours differ across countries and time? What's the model? Constrained optimization. We're teaching indifference curves and feasible sets. Critically evaluate the model. Remember, that's one of the things that 
employers' feedback to us. Students have got to be more critical. Can workers really choose their hours of work? What about the influence of culture and politics? Go to the present them with the data, time series, cross-section, develop the theory, go back to the data. Literally the same things are on the axes, free time and goods from the model, from the data, 1900 from up here and 1913, the data. The data appears connected with the model in a way that's typically not done in economics. Interactive learning is great. Students click through these things. The fast students can learn it having clicked through the model twice. Students who find it more difficult can go through it 100 times. And that doesn't hold up the classroom. We have more economists in action videos. Uh, as I said, on your mobile, you can, you can do the MCQs and get feedback uh, about your understanding. Another example, uh, we want to teach tools that can be applied to different problems. What about the firm setting the price? Monopoly firm, standard example taught in every course. But students want to know about situations where it's not just benevolent policy makers out there. Why can't we develop a model where there's a rent-seeking elite that sets the tax? Looks pretty similar. Downward sloping line, replace the demand curve by duration curve, replace the ISO profit curve facing the firm with an ISO rent curve, and you're really empowering students to see economics is really great. You learn these tools and you can apply them to very different kinds of problems. But your real question is, does it work? Is this just kind of uh, hot air? Do students come out actually being able to do anything? It's extremely difficult, and those of you who've worked with ethics committees know, know that doing a kind of RCT is, uh, is impossible in this area. You just can't get it through. So this is weak evidence in that sense, but it's some evidence. It's saying students who've been exposed to this new course in their first year, but do the exact unchanged second year exams, intermediate level exams. How do they do compared with the previous cohort? Nothing happens in econometrics, as you might expect, but in the intermediate micro and macro, then we lose the lower tail, the problem of really weak students performing badly in the second year, in these really tough second year courses that were unchanged. So there's something about teaching economics very, very differently in the first year that seems to generate better performance <coughs> later on. Why does it work? One reason is that we use exactly the same model for incredibly different problems. So the first one there is looking at selfish and altruistic preferences. This is a bargaining problem, and this is a macro uh, a central bank with its preferences and the Phillips curve as its constraint. Blue, red, objectives, constraints. Again and again, seeing the versatility of the tools. I mentioned at the beginning, students really are pushing us on this about data handling skills. Uh, we use real, real data in this set of 12 projects. You can see there's a whole range of different projects here. I encourage you to have a look. Um, every step from a student not knowing how to open a spreadsheet is clickable so they can see exactly what to do. They can also follow a video uh, of how to do it. This is taking one particular example of me measuring management practices. There's a set of learning objectives. This is using survey data, so they learn about survey data. They have to describe it. Then they have to do some, some visualization, and they have to write up their results. Students need coding now. Some of them are now coming in with coding, but many economics departments haven't switched to the use of R. They still stick with Stata, for example, for teaching econometrics. Students are really pushing us. So using doing economics, they can get on and teach themselves uh, how to use R and, and produce, as I said, professional level uh, data visualizations at a very early stage. This is very satisfying for students. They really like going to the real data and being able to uh, prepare this kind of output. And I'll stop there. <coughs>